and to think about the accident at Fukushima. And I'm going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ian Fairley. Dr. Fairley is a, a well-known expert. Uh, he has a, a fantastic website. If you haven't ever gone there, it's uh, lots of resources. He is a radiation biologist and he's written a lot about um, the effects of human on humans of ionizing radi radiation and he's written about leukemia cl clusters around power stations and many other topics. So I'm going to just hand straight over to Dr. Fairley to, uh, to carry on and do this talk. We think he'll talk for maybe about half an hour at most um, and then there'll be time for some questions and discussion but you can post questions in the chat throughout his talk if you want so that there's some material lined up there for us to get going with um, when he's finished so thank you very much for being here and I'm now handing over to Dr Fairley. Um, so am I on now? Then I take it that I am. I can't see myself, but I'm, I presume that I am on. Yep, uh, go for it. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Um, first of all, thank you very much for uh, coming to this uh, seminar. Um, uh, I want to say, first of all, that I am Scottish. And my family lived near Falkirk, and uh, I'm very proud and happy to be to give a talk um, on the Scottish CND website. Now, ten years ago, um, this power station here, uh, at Fukushima in Japan, this is uh, Reactor One, Reactor Two, Three, and Four, um, suffered um, uh, a very serious accident. Um, first of all, there was a, uh, an earthquake about four miles off the coast. And on March the 11th, as you can see, 2011, at 3.30 in the afternoon, this wave, this tidal wave, hit the power station. Um, these are uh, actual footage from the Japanese uh, station. Um, the tidal wave came sweeping into the power station. Uh, this is a car park. You can't see the cars because they're covered with water. Um, three days later, or one day later, I should say, um, on March the 12th, there was um, an expo explosion at Unit 1 um, at uh, Fukushima. And then two days after that, on March the 13th, there was uh, another explosion, at, this time at Unit 3. And these were captured on webcams. But there were two more explosions which happened in the night and which were not captured on webcams. The reason for these explosions was because of the buildup of hydrogen fuel or hydrogen gas, I should say, inside the reactors. Um, this caused these explosions. This is uh, some photographs. Um, this is unit four here, and this is unit three. You can see they're compared with the previous shots that I showed you, they were utterly demolished. This led to radioactive emissions. This is the power station here uh, throughout large parts of Japan. The green zone is where there are lower emissions or lower deposition, and the maroon is where there were much, much higher deposition of cesium-137. By the way, for your interest, this is uh, Tokyo here. It's Tokyo Harbor and uh, Tokyo Bay. And so you can see that large parts were deposited in Tokyo. Tokyo's got a population of 30 million. Um, large amounts were dumped of uh, radio radioactivity dumped in the sea, the Pacific Ocean. This is Japan here. And you can see the radioactivity being monitored by the United States monitoring the satellites going around the, around the world. This is Hawaii here. And just to 
proved that this happened around the world. This is uh, Fukushima here. And right around the world, we've got the deposition of cesium-137, including in Britain as well. So it's a worldwide event. The present situation at Fukushima is that there are uh, ongoing very heavy, large leaks of contaminated water from the reactors. And I've given you uh, some web links here. Um, there's also uh, radioactive waste being produced by the decontaminated, uh, by the decontamination process, I should say. We've got the dangerous nature of the melted reactor cores, and we've got spent fuel and precarious ponds sitting on top of the reactors. So it's the accident is still going on, most importantly. The Japanese government has tried to clean up the mess, and this is 10 years later, and it's got these huge, well, 23 million. Um, and just let me go back. 23 million uh, plastic sacks like this. Um, these sacks have only got a, an estimated life of about five years. And as you can see, there's a lot of humble jumble in the middle. Um, basically, in other words, what I'm getting at is that um, the reaction of the authorities has been really bad, very piecemeal, and not very safe. So as you say. Um, these are uh, contaminated cities, and uh, this is Nami, um, which have, have been evacuated, they're ghost towns. And these are, uh, these are two people who are really wearing um, gowns and masks, um, who are doing, uh, monitoring the residual levels of radioactivity. In fact, um, I'm maybe going to the next one. The present, the present situation is that 50,000 people are still evacuated. Originally, about 150,000 people 10 years ago uh, were evacuated. There's tens of thousands of cases of uh, PTSD, depression, anxiety, suicides. Um, altogether, about 3,500 people um, died from the nuclear part of the accident, from evacuations, from ill health, and from suicides. Um, about 40,000 workers were exposed. These are high doses. And we expect from the estimates of uh, collected dose that there would be about 50,000 or 5,000, I should say, um, fatal cancers over the next 60 years or so. 8% of the land area of Japan, including parts of Tokyo, were contaminated. And the economic losses, well, anywhere between 300 and 500 billion pounds. It could be more than that. So altogether, it was a pretty bad show. And as I say, the action is still going on. And well, what lessons does this? does this accident have for us here and now? And here are some questions that I thought that you might be, be interested in. First of all, how many reactors are there in Scotland? How old are they? Are they dangerous? Should be closed? A government position, um, both in uh, uh, Edinburgh and London. And perhaps most important, what can we do? As you can see, there are two reactors at Hunterston and two at Torness in Scotland, but um, EDF, um, these are operated by EDF, um, which is a, a French nuclear conglomerate, run by the French government. Um, there are um, other sets of reactors, Haitian 1, Haitian 2, Hartlepool, Inkley, and Dungeness, as well as a PWR at Sizewell. This is, um, shows you the, the start dates of the reactor, various reactors, and their age now in Scotland, Hunterson B is 45 years old, the two reactors. Torness, 33 years old, 
And by the, when they finally are going to be closing, this is how old they'll be. Now, there's a, a serious problem with the reactors at Hunterson, and it's these graphite bricks. There's about 3,000 of them uh, at Hunterson B, at each reactor. Now, the trouble is that they are cracked, and the cracks occur where my um, uh, screen monitor is. This shows you the, the barrels and um, how they fit in with each other inside the graphite core of the reactor. Um, the fuel rods go in here, and the coolant goes everywhere around about. The trouble is that, that hundreds of these graphite barrels, as I call them, are cracked in both the reactors, more than 20% of them. Um, but the problem is that EDF finance scientists at the University of Manchester insist from their models, computer models, that it's safe to keep the reactors going. And the Office for Nuclear Regulation agrees with the EDF. In my view, this is, this is very unwise. It's uh, very not precautionary. Uh, especially since we don't need the reactors. The problem is that these uh, barrels, these graphite barrels, are splitting down the middle like this. This is an illustrative example of brick cracking from EDF. Now, if anything were to go wrong, this is where Henderson is, then the, um, and there was a catastrophic uh, release of radionuclides from the reactors. This is where these are the the downwind path um, from Hunterson B. In other words, um, the prevailing winds go from the, the south here, um, southwest here, up to the northeast. In other words, uh, if you look at the wind roses, you'll see that about 70% of the wind blows in this direction. Well, we all know that, that the weather comes from the west. But the problem is that, um, that Glasgow and Edinburgh are right in the fuel path. And my folks too, my family in Walker, they're in the fuel path too, or the, uh, the path of the, of the, the plumes, the radioactive plumes that would occur. Um, Jane, will you stop this? Sorry, phone call. Um, now, the, the obvious question is, um, do we need these reactors to run? Well, we don't. Um, this is what, uh, where we get our electricity in Scotland from at the present moment. The renewables, mm, about 8%. Um, and there's also sizable exports of from wind and uh, solar to England as well. Um, about we get about ten percent of our electricity from gas and up at Peterhead, the gas uh, uh, powered reactor, uh, powered station at Peterhead. We get about ten percent, maybe eleven percent from nuclear. The point is that we could even easily shut down Hunterson B and even turn off, um, and still be okay for electricity supplies in Scotland. The present situation in Hunterson B is this, that reactor three was closed temporarily on March the 3rd. Um, reactor four is expected to close very early in April. And, but they may be restarted again. Um, the question as to whether the will will be decided when they look, look at the graphite um, bricks um, after they've been closed down temporarily. And if there's lots of cracking, lots more cracking, they will not be opened. But if there's just a, a little bit of crack, more cracking, they will probably be reopened again, which is unfortunate. However, both of reactor three and reactor four are to be shut and defueled before January the 7th next year. And for those people who are really interested in this, if you choose a website, which will tell you what is happening at all the reactors of, and that, uh, which are run by EDF. 
Now I want to turn to a question that uh, is probably in many people's minds, and that is newspapers churn out false stories day after day after day that nuclear power is carbon free. Well, it isn't. Um, the thing is that nuclear fuel has a, a very large carbon footprint. And this is never referred to in the newspaper articles or in the media articles that you see on a daily basis. For a start, let's look at uranium mining. This is um, the uranium mine in uh, Namibia. It's one of the largest in the world. These little pinpricks here are gigantic dumper trucks with wheels about uh, 10 feet high. These are really, so this mine here is extremely large and you can see, and it's just, just one mine. There's about a hundred of these mines around the world. And if we look at all the other steps in the nuclear fuel chain, there's mining, milling, you have to convert, um, the uranium comes out to uranium hexafluoride. You have to enrich it um, to, so there's more radioactivity. Um, you have to make the fuel, you have to build a reactor, it takes 10, 12 years. Then you get reactor operation. And that's the only thing the newspapers look at is whether there's any CO2 coming from the reactor. Then you have radioactive waste treatment you have to build a huge underground mine, and, which is a uh, heavy, heavy carbon footprint. Now, all of these steps have, as I say here, have got um, carbon footprints and you need LCA, that stands for life cycle analysis. But when you do that, and this is what the figures come out, um, this is um, grams of CO2 per, um, megawatt hour. You can see for wind and solar, geothermal, it's quite low. For nuclear, uh, it's not very low. But uh, for comparison, you can see that um, coal is much higher. Basically, the take home message here is that nuclear isn't really, um, it's certainly not um, zero carbon. And it's not particularly low carbon either. It's, I would call, medium carbon. And there are much better ways of getting our electricity apart from nuclear. And one other thing that uh, many people write and uh, make um, ill-advised comments about is the number of jobs that are involved. Now this is data, actual government data from the Office for uh, National Statistics. That's what ONS stands for, okay? And this is uh, the, the newest data that I've got and it's to the nearest thousands. And those, these figures are rounded round to the nearest thousand. The renewables have got about an FTE stands for full time equivalent jobs, okay? So that's how you take uh, care of part time and temporary workers. For renewables, you've got about 49, 50,000 or so. For any energy efficient products, about 100,000. For low carbon, that's uh, low emission vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, 83,000 jobs. For en energy efficient lights alone, LEDs, 25,000 jobs. Nuclear, 13,000 jobs. And that's mostly in reprocessing in solar field, which doesn't generate electricity, it actually uses a lot of it. So when people tell, start saying to you, or prattling on about all the jobs are going to be created by nuclear. It's a fairy tale. The correct word, in fact, is a shibboleth. You know, it's accepted as a truth, but it's not true. So I'm coming to my conclusions now, and that is that CO2 is a, a remarkably poor way to reduce carbon. It's too slow, and we need to implement carbon horizon right, right away. It's very expensive certainly not clean, it's not green, and it's not sustainable. I'd like to finish off by saying that, um, or quoting um, what George Santayana said um, towards the end of his life. He said that governments who are unable to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And that 
may even apply to us because the Conservative government in Westminster is hell-bent on um, financing the building of more nuclear reactors. Thanks very much for your attention and I'll take some questions now.